Hello everyone and welcome to our 2021 Research Awards Research Roundtable as part of National Epilepsy Week. Many of you will know that every National Epilepsy Week, Epilepsy Research UK announces our research funding for the year and this year we've also featured other exciting events. So on Sunday we featured our glittering award ceremony on Tuesday, we had coffee with Cronut the sea lion and learned about the fascinating work in interneurons of the Barbon Lab in San Francisco. And yesterday we heard from Professor Helen Cross and Kishan Vyas from GW Pharmaceuticals for a Hot Topics webinar on the facts about cannabinoids and epilepsy. In case you missed these, you can watch the recordings on the webinar section of our website, which will be linked to you in the chat. But what about today? So today we're going to be hearing from our newly awarded researchers. This year, Epilepsy Research UK awarded research funding of 1.3 million, including two Emerging Leader Fellowship Awards and two doctoral training centres. So without further ado, here to introduce the awardee of the Epilepsy Research UK and Young Epilepsy Fellowship Award is Young Epilepsy's Chief Executive, Mark Devlin. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Quiva. It's really great to be with you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to kick off the awards today. We're so pleased to be part of this event and to introduce the first ever um, ERUK and Young Epilepsy Joint Fellowship Award. Um, our working together to champion research into the childhood epilepsies represents a natural alliance of common purpose, of which we certainly in Young Epilepsy are extremely proud. When the opportunity first arose to partner with um, ERUK following a, a conversation that Maxine and I had, um, we had just launched our new strategy of which research was a core offer, as you'd expect. Um, and within that, we've got a strong commitment to um, putting young people at the centre of everything we do, acting with courage and ambition and working collaboratively. So embarking on our first ever joint fellowship with ERUK met this new direction almost, almost perfectly. Um, the Joint Fellowship Award provides research funding for an exceptional epilepsy researcher to develop their career in paediatric epilepsy research and eventual research leadership. As we all know, the childhood epilepsies include some of the most complex and potentially disabling conditions and can be associated with many co-occurring developmental and emotional issues. These at times can have an even greater impact on a young life than the epilepsy itself. So, Navigating this, the educational challenges, social hurdles, and a fourfold greater risk of mental health um, for, for young people with epilepsy, whilst managing their you know, chronic condition, presents a really formidable obstacle course for children and their families. And that's why research into earlier diagnosis and, and effective treatment is so, so important. We are both Young Epilepsy in ERUK passionate about including the um, real life stories and voices of young people in our work. And as a result, the scope and awarding process for the fellowship was developed in partnership with the um, Young Reps Group um, uh, of Young Epilepsy, a group of young people with epilepsy who give their time and to sense check and shape our work as a charity. We're so grateful um, to them for their work on this fellowship and for their grilling of the candidates as part of the interview process. So without further ado, um, it's my great honor to introduce and congratulate the awardee for the first ever ERUK and Young Epilepsy Joint Fellowship. Our winner is an exceptional um, researcher whose career we have seen go from strength to strength, and we're extremely proud to be part of the next chapter in their no doubt stellar trajectory. So no pressure there, Tim, okay? Um, congratulations go to Dr. Tim Tierney um, of UCL Institute of Neurology and the Welcome Centre for hum Human Neuroimaging. So well done, Tim, and over to you. Um. Thanks, Megan Mark, for, for that introduction. Um, just to confirm, everyone can see my screen. It's all okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to kick off with a question. Did you know that your brain is magnetic? Not a lot of people do, but it is. You may know that your brain contains brain cells called neurons, which communicate to each other using electrical signals. Now, every time an electrical signal passes through a wire or a brain cell, it also generates a magnetic field. So if you have a seizure, which generates electrical activity, it will also generate a magnetic field. 
we can measure this magnetic field using a technique or technology called magnetoencephalography, or MEG for short. An MEG system um, looks something a little like this. You may be wondering why it is so large. And it is so large because it, it contains superconductors, which need liquid helium to keep them cool at minus 270 degrees. And while that is all very complicated, these, um, this technology can provide an exquisite picture of the magnetic fields generated by the brain's activity. I've got a little animation here showing what a magnetic field from the brain might look like. Now, the key thing to know is that these magnetic fields are different depending on which brain region is active. So this is the magnetic field from one brain region, this is a magnetic field from a different brain region, and another magnetic field from a different brain region again. And that's quite important because it means that if you have a seizure, we can measure the magnetic field from that seizure and work out exactly in the brain where that came from. We can pass that information along to the clinical team and they can decide whether or not you're a candidate for brain surgery to ultimately help you live a life free from epilepsy. But there is a problem with this system. And that is that typically young people, the, the success of this technology in young people is quite poor. And, and that's simply because young people, if you put them in a brain scanner, they tend to move about quite a lot. And just like taking a photograph of someone who's moving, you get a reduced quality image when someone moves about. So over the last few years, I've been working on a technology that will allow us to image brain activity even while someone is moving around. So we've already seen what the traditional old systems look like. Well, recently in the last few years, we've been working on a different system in collaboration with a company called QSpin. Now each of these little black sensors does the same job as this half ton machine. So we've already reduced the size of this brain imaging system from half a ton down to about a kilo. But you may look at this and think, oh, that looks, that looks a little bit sci-fi. I'm not sure if I want my kid to wear that. And we agree, which is why we've been working tirelessly on optimizing the system for use with young people. And we've been helped massively by a company called Chalk Studios, which helps us design our helmets and brain scanning helmets. And now the current system looks a little something like this, which is a much more sleek design with sensors the size of Lego bricks, weighing just a few hundred grams. So this innovation, this miniaturization of a half ton machine down to a few hundred grams has allowed us to develop a program of research for understanding development in young children. And I just want to share with you now some of the images from some of the work we've been doing with young people. So our first, our first um, pilot study, we just involved drilling holes in a bike helmet and putting sensors inside. But as time went on and then we miniaturized the designs, we started uh, progressing more and more and developing helmets that were ideally suited for working with young people. And the great thing about this whole process was how much all the kids enjoyed it and in, in some cases, how much their, their parents enjoyed it too. So now that we have a brain imaging system that we know works for kids and can help plan brain surgery, what are the remaining challenges? What comes next? And this is where my fellowship really becomes important. This technology requires what is called a magnetically shielded room in which to operate. And what this room does is it essentially, it blocks out all the magnetic fields that might come from passing cars or power lines or nearby trains and allows us to focus in on brain activity exclusively. And while this is amazing, the problem is it's large and expensive and no hospital in the UK has access to one of these uh, rooms. So that means that's a severe limitation on how this technology can proliferate. So my research, my fellowship, is gonna focus on how we can get this technology out of the laboratory and bring it to the clinic, bring it to the bedside. Now, how I'm gonna do that is by using these panels that we can place either side of a patient's bed. And what these panels do is they actually can create a magnetic field that is both equal and opposite to all those interfering fields that come from the trains and cars and elevators and anything nearby that would obscure our brain activity. Now, 
This might all sound a little bit complicated, but it's the exact same principle on which noise cancelling headphones are built. That essentially, we want to block out all the noise of the outside world so that we can focus in on the signals we're interested in. And this innovation will allow us to truly bring this technology from the, from the laboratory and into the clinic to help us plan brain surgery in an environment that's suited for kids. So if I have to summarize all these things that I've just said to you and wrap up, um, I'm gonna use magnetic fields to help plan brain surgery. I'm gonna do it in a way that is optimized for a pediatric environment and also do it at the bedside without the need for these big, heavy, costly, magnetically shielded rooms. And all this would not be possible without you know, the support of Epilepsy Research UK and Young Epilepsy, and of course, you, the, the community who ultimately funds all this research. I wanna say from the bottom of my heart, I'm overjoyed to have this fellowship and I wanna thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a fascinating presentation and really so exciting to, to go from a scanning machine weighing, did you say half, half a ton to something the size of a few Lego bricks and weighing, you know, a couple of hundred of hundreds of grams. And um, everyone's been commenting that they've been loving the photos of the, the prototype development as well. Um, so thanks so much, Tim, and huge congratulations again on this fellowship. We'll be bringing you back along with all of our speakers at the end of the webinar. Um, but for now, we're going to hear from our 2021 Emerging Leader Fellow, Dr. Gareth Morris, um, who will be coming on screen any moment now. Here he is. Huge congratulations, Gareth. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing about your research and what Batman has to do with the brain. Thanks so much, Quiva. Um, can you hear me okay and see the screen and everything? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, as, as Quiva mentioned, I'm going to try to explain my fellowship research and project through the medium of Batman. We'll see how well that goes, but I hope it's a nice analogy. Um, and to give the more kind of scientific title, it's using micro RNAs to control precise treatments for epilepsy. Um, and so obviously from the start, a huge thank you to ERUK and to their supporters for this award, and also to University College London, where this work will take place. So, you know, you're probably thinking, what has Batman got to do with any of this? This is an epilepsy webinar. Um, and I have to confess, I'm not a Batman expert, but to give the analogy, you know, Batman is always there in the city of Gotham. He's like, he's in the background most of the time. He's not doing anything, whatever Batman does with his spare time. Um, but then when, when something bad happens and there's a crime and, and Batman is needed to spring into superhero action and save the day, they shine this, this signal into the sky. And then when Batman sees that signal, you know, he kind of wakes up, stops playing his Xbox or whatever, and he jumps into life and solves the problem. Um, so we'll come back to that in a little while. And I just want to briefly introduce these microRNA molecules. So these are something that I've been studying myself for the last five years or so. Um, and what I'm here in this slide is just a very basic overview of how our DNA, our genetic code, actually gets turned into to us. So genetic information is stored in this form as DNA. Um, it undergoes a process which we call transcription and makes these kind of temporary messenger molecules called mRNA. And then those molecules are used to actually build proteins, which are kind of like building blocks that make up our cells and ultimately make up us. And microRNA is kind of a, a little level of control built into that system. And so it comes in here between these temporary messages and the final building blocks. And it basically acts like a stop sign. And when you throw in those microRNAs, you reduce the amounts of certain proteins within our cells, which has you know, strong imp implications for how cells are working and, and what happens in our bodies, um, particularly in the brain. So to bring that into to epilepsy, um, 
my work over the last few years has shown that you know, we can directly block the activity of certain microRNAs, and in doing so, um, we can powerfully reduce seizures in, in epilepsy models. And alongside that direct therapeutic targeting, we also know that the levels, the amounts of some microRNAs in the brain are really strongly linked to epilepsy. And one thing that I've seen is that for particular microRNAs, their levels really shoot up, they, they rise sharply just before a brain moves into an epileptic state and may generate seizures. Um, and, and within the human brain, there are over 2,000 different microRNAs. So there's a huge number of these to, to profile and to choose from. So to give you an example here from my previous work, you know, this is in a model of epilepsy at the beginning. This is you know, a, a non-epileptic brain. And over the time course here of, of epilepsy development, the level of this microRNA really shoots up to a high point here just before you know, epilepsy actually starts. So you know, going back to Batman, this could well be our bat signal from the brain, which alerts um, that epilepsy and seizures could be happening. Um, and so the first part of my, my fellowship is really to develop this kind of bat signal for epilepsy. Um, and to do that, we really need to better understand that relationship between micro and epilepsy. So for example, you know, Tim mentioned that the brain is made up of neurons and there's also a bunch of other cells in there. And we really need to understand exactly which cells in the brain produce these changes in microRNAs. Alongside that, we need to know when that happens. Do these microRNAs change before seizures happen or after? What is like that, that temporal relationship between the microRNAs and epilepsy? And finally, can we use the signal to, to target the particular cells that are um, producing microRNAs without impacting on the function of, of other cells that have nothing to do with epilepsy? And so, you know, all in all, this will design what I'm gonna call an epilepsy dependent BAT signal. And using this BAT signal, I want to design more precise treatments for epilepsy. So I want to create some kind of treatment which responds to that epilepsy dependent microRNA signal. One potential option for this could be a microRNA dependent gene therapy. So, we already know very well that gene therapy is an exciting avenue to treat epilepsy um, and could possibly represent a one-off and, and permanent treatment. And what I want to do is to design a gene therapy which is switched on by these specific microRNA signals, which I will characterize in my fellowship. And so, you know, in theory, it's only active when the brain is developing towards an epileptic state and may hopefully be able to stop seizures before they happen. Um, so, you know, that could act like the Batman in the brain responding to those signals and jumping into action when it's needed. And finally, what does this mean for people with epilepsy potentially? Um, there's the possibility of a one-off treatment for epilepsy, as I mentioned, is the case with other kinds of gene therapy. Um, I hope that this will have minimal adverse effects on brain function by working in this kind of on-demand way that it's only active when the signal is present and when it's needed. And finally, these microRNA signatures that I'll characterize may actually be able to predict seizures or predict the movement of the brain into an epileptic state and activate this therapy before the seizures can actually happen. So, so that's the big hope. Um, finally, just to say thank you to ELUK again and the supporters who, who fund this work and I guess also to Batman for helping me to explain it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gareth. That was really, really interesting and great to hear how Batman is relevant to research into epilepsy. Just, just a quick question. There's been a lot of advances in gene therapy recently how does this differ from what's what's currently out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned, the gene therapy field, um, which is very strong within the host institute at UCL, you know, they've made a lot of advances recently. 
Um, the real novelty of, of what I will do is using this microRNA system to, to target the gene therapy. Um, what I hope is the power of using microRNA is, as I mentioned, there are thousands of different ones. So there's you know, a lot of different options to use as this signal. Um, there's the chance that, that they might increase their levels, as I say, before seizures can happen. Um, and they, they might represent a more epilepsy specific signal. But all of these things need to be studied in the first part of the fellowship. And you know, that's why this money is so important to, to develop the project. Brilliant, thanks so much, Gareth, and huge congratulations again. Um, for now, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Rhys Thomas at Newcastle University, who is here from the Epilepsy Research UK, Newcastle University Doctoral Training Centre. So huge congratulations, Rhys, and we're really looking forward to hearing about this exciting award. Yeah, thank you, Quiva. So um, this is all about putting us in a situation to really have the Gareths or the Tims of the next generation here in Newcastle. I mean, what fantastic talks we've just heard. Um, so uh, the award of this doctoral hub to Newcastle allows us to invest in people, both the people who will be the direct recipients of these uh, studentships and fellowships, but also the supervisors. There's something about creating this environment, this culture for getting first time supervisors and experienced researchers together here in Newcastle at the same time that uh, is particularly exciting to us. So um, we started with a blank page and uh, we tried to put all our best ideas here and actually the best thing we could do is build partnerships and buddy people up. So we brought in some industrial partners. Uh, uh, Arvel, who are an anti-epilepsy drug um, company and Unique, who are a, a biotechnology company, uh, have provided financial support and with the, um, an example of Unique, they're also gonna have an industrial placement as part of the studentships. We've had support through Newcastle University, which I'm really grateful for, and also the Wellcome Centre for Mitochondrial Research, helping with the application, but also with the facilities and the environment when uh, the program goes live. But of course, the big investment came from Epilepsy Research UK. These partners and the university would not, could not have done this if it wasn't for the challenge laid down by Epilepsy Research UK of, of pulling all this together. And I'm hoping this will be an attractive model for continuing this doctoral hub long into the future. So what are we going to do? We're going to start off with six master's students. These will be um, perhaps people from a, a biological background or computing background. We're going to provide them with their fees so that they're not too out of pocket coming to us in Newcastle doing an epilepsy themed master's in neuroscience. They're going to be with us with the supervisors learning how to code, learning how to handle big volumes of data, learning how to work with industrial partners, learning about intellectual property and being part of our epilepsy seminars here. Then the, the master students who impress and the master students who are happy to sail on Newcastle have an opportunity to apply to be part of our six PhD students here. And so for some people, it'll be a, a four year program going through from masters through to PhD here in Newcastle. So what are we going to be doing? We, we really think that what sets out the next generation of researchers is we, how they deal with technology how they handle big data, how they handle with coding, mathematical analysis, looking at array data, looking at unusual data sets. I think those are the skills that we needed so that people aren't just doing research, they're leading research. And I think that really defines the difference between people who dabble and people who do currently. So it's about computational analysis, really helping people have the best of computer skills, coding skills to handle big mathematics challenges, about how do you handle data that comes from long-term EEG, creating new coding and prediction models. So how do you um, use the data you've got to be able to predict the future? Then using sort of techniques we have in the house, such as two photon electron microscopy, or looking at microbiome data. So studying um, what you leave behind, so data from uh, the bowel. So the PhDs <clears throat> are designed to tessellate. They're designed to fit in alongside each other. They, they are interlocking. Three are based on looking at mechanisms of epilepsy. So we've paired up uh, Professor Trevelyan, Professor Banerjee, looking at if we discover mechanisms of epilepsy, can we change these with medicines? Are they druggable? We've got a first time supervisor 
in Dr. Lax, paired with a, a researcher who's new to epilepsy, Professor Stewart, looking at accelerated models. For us, this is looking at what mitochondrial epilepsy can teach us about other epilepsies, because it's like epilepsy on fast forward. Then we have Professor Forsyth, who is himself a former ERUK recipient with Dr. Alberio, looking at new ways to treat status epilepticus based upon a previous Epilepsy Research UK award. The next three PhDs are based on prediction and intervention. Can we guess what's going to happen and can we stop it from happening? So Professor Jackson, Professor LeBeau have been working as part of the Can Do project here, which is looking at um, uh, optogenetic approaches, that's uh, devices that can be light into uh, cells that are sensitive to light to try and help seizures. And so they will continue that work here. We've got Dr. Yang, Dr. Taylor, looking at the amount of data that can be collected by a long-term EEG, that's people who have EEG worn for months on end, and could that help people with their monitoring at home? In a post-COVID world, anything that can be done at home is better. And then myself and Dr. Stewart are going to be looking at what your gut health can teach you about who's vulnerable to epilepsy, who's vulnerable to epilepsy, medicine side effects, and more. So all of these projects are designed to tessellate, to cross cover. It's something about the critical mass of working together, about having colleagues doing similar but different PhDs alongside you, learning similar but different skills that help to prop each other up and support each other. Overarching this is a governance board to help support people as they go through, both supporting the supervisors and the students. And our impact is not just in the output, in terms of scientific output, papers, presentations, abstracts, but it's in the people. We really hope that we're going to get the next Tims, the next Gareths here at Newcastle, keep some and export some to help epilepsy research in the UK. On this slide here, you see I've mentioned the Shape Epilepsy Network. They're going to be integral into the helping us both in terms of understanding people with epilepsy and their needs, but also disseminating the impact of this. So the Shape Epilepsy Research Network is a novel, large uh, user experience research network set up by Epilepsy Research UK last year. Some people are going to be involved as advocates. Some people are going to be influencers. Some people are going to help us shape uh, the priorities for epilepsy research. And some are going to help our students who are coming through to really understand what it's like to live with epilepsy and look after somebody with epilepsy and give them that um, that experience that you just can't gain by staring down a microscope so as i said we're actually investing in phd projects but we're really investigating in people it's the uh skills that are gained by the researchers being part of this doctoral hub and what's gained for the supervisors as well we've been able to bring in people who are great at their game, as I said, the mitochondrial researchers, the microbiome researchers, the engineers, who could be doing other work. But because of this, we've managed to focus everything down in. So actually, they're going to be focusing on epilepsy work over the next five years, which we think is really exciting here. So we can't wait to get started. And I think our first master's students could be in as early as this summer. Thank you very much for this award. Thank you so much, Reese. That was so interesting to hear about this work. I love what you said about they won't just be doing research, but leading research in those areas um, and the linking of the of the research projects across the doctoral training centre. Um, and of course, the involvement of our Shape Epilepsy Research Network. So huge congratulations, Reese. Um, and we'll be coming back to you at the end for for questions. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. And of course, last but certainly not least, we welcome Professor Cathy Abbott and Professor Richard Chin from the University of Edinburgh. They're here to talk about the Epilepsy Research UK University of Edinburgh Doctoral Training Centre. Um, I think Richard and Cathy are both joining us now, so we'll be seeing their screen shortly. Can you see our screen? Yep. If you just want to put it on slideshow. Ah, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, and it's so exciting to hear about all the fantastic work that is going to be done through the um, support and through all of the kind donations of, um, that went to uh, Epilepsy Research UK. 
And it, it's quite telling that, you know, we start off with childhood before we enter into adulthood. And, and uh, Tim spoke first and we heard about the significant investment in um, childhood onset epilepsies. Uh, and exactly the theme of our doctoral training center, um, improving outcomes for childhood onset epilepsies. You've already heard Reese talking about trying to um, pull together different um, um, disciplines and trying to engender a way towards moving ultimately to improving the treatment and outcomes of, uh, of people with epilepsy. And this is exactly what we're going to be doing as well, focusing all the way from mechanisms um, up towards treatment and focusing on childhood onset epilepsies. So we decided we'd, um, for this forum, we'd approach it from a what, why, where, and how approach. And we will be um, um, having six PhD studentships. Uh, there is possibly a seventh, but uh, for now, I, I think uh, six PhD studentships. And two are funded by the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. And it's really um, an indication really of um, how seriously we take this that the college has uh, invested in this. Um, another PhD will be funded by Simon's Initiative for Developing Brain. Uh, and this is um, an initiative which was funded by the Simon's Foundation, um, which um, is uh, very much um, uh, centered around autism research. But as we know, uh, you've heard from the um, before, previous speakers about the overlap that epilepsy is not just seizures, it also involves lots of other neurodevelopmental problems, including autism. And of course, three funded by Epilepsy Research UK. And it has to be said uh, that this is a major investment because without um, Epilepsy Research UK's um, investment, we wouldn't have been able to leverage the um, additional funding. So thank you very much again. We are looking to start um, with two tranches starting in September, 2022, and then another um, um, set in 2023. And the students will join a thriving postgraduate um, um, community here uh, with joint training opportunities in clinical discovery pathways all the way from, you know, in petri dishes all the way right up to um, the clinical bedside. And why? Well, uh, as a pediatric neurologist um, I, I, and a childhood um, uh, epileptologist, I think that um, compared to um, other areas, childhood onset epilepsy is vastly, vastly um, underrepresented and under, um, uh, you know, invested. So to hear young epilepsy and ER UK um, recognizing that, and again, um, putting together that fellowship for Tim, and then now investing in this um, doctoral training center, concentrating on childhood onset epilepsies is refreshing. And, you know, childhood onset epilepsies um, occur between 0.5 to 1% of the populations. For every school, um, you know, one out of, you know, one out of every 100 students in that school or one out of 200 will have epilepsy. It is as common as diabetes, um, but many more people will know someone with diabetes rather than someone with epilepsy. And part of that is because of the stigma associated with it. The, the childhood onset epilepsies themselves have direct immediate effects on quality of life, even when the seizures are well controlled, and this can continue into adulthood. 80% of children with epilepsy have issues with learning difficulties, and this is uh, something work which had been highlighted in collaboration with young epilepsy. And 30% of children with childhood onset epilepsies are unresponsive to current treatments. And these are very sobering um, statistics and we really need to do something about this. So our aim is to uncover through this doctoral training center, fundamental mechanisms in the brain and to develop novel methods for early identification to drive discovery of better treatments. So it's not just about the research and Kathy will talk about um, uh, you know, the investment that we have in researchers um, and uh, you know, where are we going to be doing this? Well, uh, we'll be based in Edinburgh um, so, you know, your, the previous doctoral training centers in Newcastle, so there would be a bit of synergy um, opportunities there, if you will, the powerhouses of the North um, to supplement and complement um, other areas um, in the UK. Um, it will be hosted at the Mir Maxwell Epilepsy Center, which is a virtual center, which is really a collection of, uh, of researchers that are focusing on epilepsy. And we are an up and coming um, research center. And so 
this investment will allow us to consolidate our own center, but also help to nurture and grow the next generation of researchers. So I think at that point, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Kathy. And Kathy, I'm very happy to forward the, the, um, the slides. Great, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, so yeah, if we could have the next slide. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm actually on screen, but let, let's just assume I am. <laughs> um, so we've got six specific projects for these PhD students to do. I won't go into the details of all of them, but they're quite wide ranging. Um, the first few are mostly about molecular basis of um, more rare genetic forms of childhood onset epilepsy. Um, but we range right through to looking at the ways in which EEG signals can be decoded to produce biomarkers. And then Richard's own work looking at um, outcomes for children with childhood onset epilepsies, looking at risk factors and, and biomarkers for those outcomes. And uh, I've got photos of the, the supervisors at the end, but like Newcastle, we've got a lot of of fairly junior researchers supervising these projects, together always partnered with a more experienced supervisor. Some who've not really been involved in epilepsy research in, in the past and others for whom this is their, their central work. Uh, next slide, please. So the most important thing I think is that PhD projects by their very nature can, be, can end up being very specific, um, like Newcastle and the, the program that Reese was discussing, they, there certainly will be lots of interactions between the PhD projects. There's lots of overlaps in techniques and so on. But what we were very keen to do was to make sure that the, the students didn't lose the big picture uh, and that they really understand how their research will be placed within the whole process from diagnosis to treatment. So we've got a first year training program, which will start off by um, thinking about diagnosis. So they'll be visiting clinics, going to the diagnostic labs in Edinburgh and with lots of lectures and journal clubs about epilepsy genetics. Then through to the underlying biology, again with, with lectures and their own projects. And then moving through to understanding about treatment and how drugs are discovered and clinical trials. So we have two big drug discovery labs in Edinburgh run by people who've moved from industry into academia and back in some cases. And they're going to be lecturing to the students. And we also have a clinical trials unit which um, runs training programs in implementing and managing clinical trials um, will also have the students exposed to all of that so that they can really place their their own research in this much wider context and then really importantly they'll be getting training in public engagement and lots of public engagement opportunities throughout that year and we want to embed the patient experience all the way through not just in the first year but throughout so they will um, have discussions with people with epilepsy and with parents of um, children with very severe forms of epilepsy all the way through and do similar sort of engagement to um, the program that Newcastle are going to be running. Uh, next slide please. And this just shows all of the supervisors who are going to be involved. I should say we're already talking to, to Reese and his colleagues about some, having some joint sessions with Newcastle, which will be really exciting. And I just want to say a huge thank you to Epilepsy Research UK and the fundraisers, because we're really excited about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard and Cathy, for that presentation. It's so interesting to hear about the, the really broad range of, of individual PhD student topics that you're going to have as part of this centre. And brilliant, again, to see that the patient experiences will be embedded throughout the, the doctoral training centre. Thank you so much and huge congratulations. Um, and I'd now like to welcome back all of our awardees for some roundtable questions that have been submitted. Um, so they'll be joining us now. Welcome back, everyone. So first of all, um, first of all, again, a huge congratulations on the research awards and such a, we even within the doctoral training centers, but across all of our projects, we have 
a really broad range of topics being addressed. Um, and I wonder if we could perhaps first talk about how long you think it'll be before we see the impact of this research on people with epilepsy. Tim, would you like to, to answer first? Sure. Um, one of the things I, I didn't mention in, in my, my talk is that I've been collaborating with, with Young Epilepsy, who are developing one of the first clinical MEG centers in the UK. Um, so as I am doing my research, I can just get on the train, go down to Young Epilepsy, and within a few weeks, um, start building stuff down there to get direct access to my technology for patients with epilepsy. So that's, that's how specialist centers can get access to my technology. Um, in terms of more long-term worldwide access, that, 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 uh, that was going to take a few years. A few years, brilliant. And Gareth, the same question for you. When do you think this, this research will impact patients in the clinic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so not as soon as Tim's, for sure. Um, so I'm jumping in more at the kind of preclinical research end of things. Um, it is a little bit hard to predict, of course, um, but, you know, as a rough estimate, maybe around something like five years after the end of the fellowship might be realistic. So it is kind of a, a medium term aim in the next five to 10 years, say, to try to begin some serious clinical trials. Wow, that's really exciting and not, not too far in the distant future either. Rhys, in terms of the, the doctoral training centre at Newcastle University, um, how long do you think it will be before we see the impact of this research for people with epilepsy, but also I suppose the, the epilepsy research environment? Oh. Sorry, Reese, you're on mute. Oh, no, I've done that one, have I? Yeah, I mean, there are whole different levels of impact, and I think we've already started to see it. I mean, it's just been great to have that visibility this week. In terms of for people with epilepsy, we've got some PhD programmes that are going to join existing bodies of work. So, for example, some of the neuroengineering, looking at optogenetics. That's really the next stage of that is to go into a human trial. And, you know, that's going to be really exciting. As opposed to some of the other work is a little bit more speculative and it's going to be helping us know which projects to back and which ones are probably not going to be necessarily the opportunities of the future. But the skills that you gain from doing that work is going to be something that we're going to be able to export as well as the outcome. Brilliant. And of course, we should say hello to Professor Andy Trevelyan, who you're here, um, who was the, the co-lead applicant on this application. So congrats, Andy. We hope you're, you're watching from wherever, wherever you are. The, the, the Outer Hebrides, would you believe? Well, hopefully he's able to watch from there. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Kathy and Richard, when do you think we'll have patient impact or impact on the, the epilepsy research environment from this doctoral training centre? Um, uh, how long is the length of string, really? We want to have it as uh, short a time as possible, but as you, you realise that it's not just that there's a research aspect and then there's a training aspect. And, and from a research standpoint, there are a number of different um, uh, studies which include a very basic science uh, um, preclinical studies all the way up to more human studies. And so I think it would range um, from very short term. We're already seeing some impact from the, you know, the, the, the attention that we've had since the announcement, but you know, helping to galvanize the, the current set of researchers that we have. So I would say we're already seeing an impact in the research community, um, but for um, people with epilepsy, in, I would say, I can't put a time on it, but I would say sooner, much sooner rather than later. Kathy? Yeah, I can't really improve on that, but I, I would, yeah, I would just really reiterate how exciting this has been, the amount of attention that we've had. And just the, the whole idea that you've got a, a cohort of PhD students at, at both Newcastle and Edinburgh who can be working together, it's just going to raise the profile of epilepsy research enormously, not just among the postgraduate community, but with all the collaborating groups, especially, um, you know, that Reese's involved with engineers and the companies and things. I, I wouldn't underestimate the impact that this could, could have really for a you know, relatively limited in investment in, you know, in terms of sort of huge medical research things. This is, this is going to have an impact way beyond what you'd expect, I think. 
Brilliant. That's so exciting to hear um, and really hopeful, I think, as well for the future. Um, and now I, I thought I'd ask, how will people with epilepsy be, be involved in, in your research? Um, perhaps we'll go back to Cathy and Richard for that one. Sorry, I've put you on the spot. So we're going to have a programme of, of clinic visits. We, we have, um, there's a welcome translational neuroscience programme that's worked here. So we've got some experience with actually getting all the sort of ethical permission in place for students to sit in on clinic visits. And obviously because Richard's there on the ground, this should, should help enormously. And I think that really puts it into stark sort of focus, really, what people are experiencing if, if the students can actually hear the, the, the children and their parents talk about it in clinic. But we'd, we'd also be really keen to be involved in the, the initiatives that EIDK have in, in place so that we can get involved and we'll definitely be making, making the students go to all the webinars. Brilliant, we'll, we'll welcome them with open arms. <laughs> And of course, we will be involving you in the SHAPE Network. Watch, watch this face. Uh, Reese, would you like to say about, about how people with epilepsy will be involved in, in the doctoral training centre? Oh, no. no. <laughs> they were involved from the very beginning with the creation. We uh, used to, um, our local experience with the optogenetics group can do and with the mitochondrial group. So it really gave us a patient pool. And a lot of the PhD supervision has got somebody who's clinically um, qualified within that supervisory partnership. Um, but you know, as, as um, Cathy was saying, there's no experience that can be replicated like the hands-on experience of meeting people with epilepsy and listening to them. And I think the Shape Epilepsy Research Network is our best opportunity to pair researchers with uh, people with lived experience. Brilliant. And Tim, same question to you. Sure. Um, so I, I showed in my presentation all the different helmet designs and things we've been working on to, to do the science that we've been doing. But, but now we're actually focusing on getting young people with epilepsy to help design the helmets we will use to help do the brain scans. And in that way, we're trying to incorporate the, the voices of young people with epilepsy into directly how the, the science um, happens. Brilliant, thank you. And last but not not least, Gareth. Yeah, thanks, Cuiva. So, so it's a little bit more more of a challenge, I guess, for me with a, a more kind of preclinical um, research design project. But what I have to say is, you know, from from even the outset of my my planning this proposal, um, you know, I, I'm very keen on always talking with people with epilepsy and hearing their stories and as, as Reese says, there's no substitute for hearing that lived experience from, from people. And some of the things I've, I've learned, you know, it's come up already, epilepsy is much more than just seizures. Um, and, and other things I've learned is around, you know, the challenges with adherence to drug schedules and, you know, sometimes quite nasty adverse effects associated with those. So, you know, the whole ethos of the research as I've designed it is to try to overcome these challenges, these real challenges that people face, and as, so, as such, it's designed in such a way that, that minimizes those adverse effects, aims to create potentially a permanent treatment so that people don't need, maybe, maybe don't need to keep taking drugs for the rest of their lives. Um, so, so it's really shaped, you know, around these conversations that I've had with, with people with epilepsy. Brilliant. Thanks, Gareth. And I'd like to also say a special thank you to the people affected by epilepsy who were consulted in the awarding of these grants. We worked with the young reps at Young Epilepsy and our Shape Epilepsy Research Network, and it was so important to get those, those insights on these grant applications. So a huge thank you to everyone involved with that as well. Um, it's now time for our final question. We ask everyone who appears on our webinars this question, and it's always really interesting to hear everyone's insights. What are your hopes for future research into epilepsy? Tim, how about you? Well, I, th I think it's, th this webinar in general has shown a fantastic job of the, the breadth of the research that goes on in epilepsy. 
um, Garrett's work at the fundamental molecular level right up to my work at, at the, the brain imaging level. And I think the, the PhD studentship programs show how you integrate from the very fundamental level up to the very high level. And I think what I want to see from research going forward is, is how that integrates together, how we can marry the most basic science up to the high level clinical neuroscience. So I think that, that's what I want to see going forward. And I think these PhD studentships are going to do just that. So. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Tim. Reese, how about you? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think the future is really bright for epilepsy research. I mean, you could be somebody who's compassionate and cares about uh, making maximum impact and be in this area, or you can be somebody who's just fascinated by the clinical conundrum. We've got the best scientific questions, but we've got a, a real need to increase the amount of funding for epilepsy research. I mean, per patient, for every pound spent for somebody with Parkinson's, 9p is spent for somebody with epilepsy. And so, you know, we are already behind the eight ball and doing so well that I, I, I really my ambition is that people don't accept the status quo, that people disrupt and people are pretty angry about the situation because there's so much more that we've got to do. Thank you, Reese. Richard and Kathy, um, let's take it in turns as to what your what your hopes for future research into epilepsy are. Well, I think that's sort of reflected uh, in how we approach problems. And I think you've heard, and everyone here who's on this webinar recognizes the complexity of epilepsy and you know the multifaceted aspects of it. And I think it's very clear to me that we need a multimodal approach. We need a combined collaborative approach from preclinical all the way up to clinical and an integrated approach and only then I think we can really make major, major advances. And that's why I'm so, so excited um, for the doctoral training centers and all of the investments from ER UK. Very collaborative. You've heard it right throughout all of the, the, the um, presentations today and driving forward that. So that's what I'm hoping that we combine the efforts and always focusing on the patients at the end. Thank you. So I would say, coming from a genetics background, you know, we, we now know so many different genes that, that are involved in, particularly in, in the severe childhood epilepsy, mostly very rare. Um, but I think every time we uncover a new genetic mutation, we also uncover new molecular pathways in the cell that could be targeted by drugs. And I suppose my hope would be that the impact of the research will extend well beyond the, the rare, more severe cases and actually help us to find better therapies for all forms of epilepsy. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kathy. Finally, Gareth. Yeah, you've given me the challenge of going last, Weaver, and we've just had a lot of very good answers. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, my answer would kind of summarise what everyone said, as, as Tim pointed out. We've seen today the enormous breadth of work that goes on. And, and I think Richard said, you know, a key will be to integrate all of these kinds of aspects together. Um, and, you know, my, my big hope, I guess, to wrap it up would be to see more things like precision therapies for epilepsy. So, so we've heard that, you know, epilepsy is not one condition and it, it's a kind of a coverall term for a lot of different things in reality. Um, and, you know, by integrating all of these approaches together and by putting people with epilepsy at the center of these questions, I think it really raises the prospect we can, you know, deliver very personalized and precise treatments. And, you know, I hope my fellowship can play a small part in that huge jigsaw puzzle. Brilliant. Research with people with epilepsy right in the center. I think there's no better note to, to end the webinar on. Thank you so much to all of our awardees and huge congratulations. Kathy, Richard, Reese, and Andy in the Hebrides, Tim and Gareth, huge congratulations on this funding and thank you so much for speaking about your research today. Um, let me just share my slide. Each of our speakers today um, have contributed to our research blog. So if you wish to, to find out more about their exciting research, then please do check those out on our website. Um, 
the research fund the research projects that we've heard about today are funded by our fabulous fundraisers who walk run cycle bake the list goes on to raise money for vital research into epilepsy thank you to each and every one of you for your support if you've been inspired to fundraise then why not take on our six for the 600 challenge all you need to do is think of an activity based around the number 6, 60, or even 600 if you really want to challenge yourself. And your challenge can be anything you want it to be, so get your thinking caps on. We have had a brilliant lineup of webinars this National Epilepsy Week, which will all be available to catch up on on our website. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Again, thank you to all of our awardees for speaking with us today and to Mark from Young Epilepsy for joining us earlier. Thanks to James and Becca for ensuring that the tech has run smoothly. And thank you again to everyone for tuning in. We really look forward to seeing you at the next Research Roundtable. Thanks so much.